thank you and good evening everybody. They say the face is a picture of the mind and the eyes are the interpreters. These hunting self-portraits are the work of William Arthur Mullen, American artist, after being diagnosed with Alzheimer's. This precious set of paintings reveal the vision from within a brain with Alzheimer's. Looking at the colors, at the distorted feature, uh, facial features, and at the sadness apparent in the paintings, I wonder, did he really see himself like that? Or did he forget his face within the time period of seeing his reflection in the mirror and the strike of his brush on the canvas? Perhaps we never know the answers. Next, I would like to talk to you about a woman who married when she was only 15, grade 8 of junior high school. After the youngest of her four children was 10 years old, she went back to school, finished high school, entered university, and graduated with a GPA of 3.8 out of 4 at age 46. This talented woman, who could excel in many things, developed Alzheimer's at age 68, and it is, is it still fighting with the condition. This woman was and is my mother, who is living in Iran. When my parents visited me in year 2000, my mother looked a bit different compared to two years prior to that that I had seen them. However, I could not describe how she was different. But it was to the extent that I took her to a doctor in town and in Winnipeg, and uh, the doctor ran the co most common test for dementia, which is um, a questionnaire called MOCA, or MMSE. And uh, in this questionnaire, they ask the patient to connect a bunch of letters and numbers in, in descending order, like 1 to A, A to 2, 2 to B, etc. Um, ask her to repeat a few words forward and backward. Ask her to draw a clock and show a time and a few other questions. And mom happily answered all the questions correctly and got the maximum score. And the doctor therefore told me that I was imagining any problem and mom was perfectly fine. But I was not convinced. I met them again the following year in Turkey. Again, mom felt to me different. Still, I couldn't describe how. The only thing was that she was a little bit depressed, it seemed to me. A year later, in 2002, they came back to Winnipeg again. In that year, it was quite clear to me that mom's vocabulary was not as rich as it used to be. Furthermore, I found mom to be overly anxious of getting lost. Although she never got lost in that year, However, she was overly anxious if I were lost or if my children were lost. Everybody, she was worried that everybody was getting lost. So I took her again to a neurologist that time. And sure enough, the neurologist ran the same common questionnaire test. And I never forget my mom's uh, happy smile like a schoolgirl. She aced the question and got the maximum score. The neurologist also told me, I was imagining, and my mother is fine. But I was sure that mom was going through a brain degeneration. A year later, mom's short-term memory problems appeared, even to my father. And the following year, 2004, uh, by a brain scan, MRI scan done in Washington, DC, it was confirmed that there were some changes in my mom's brain that could be associated with Alzheimer's, so she was diagnosed as a suspected of Alzheimer's. But it was four years after I had noticed that mom was different. Through the years watching mom struggling with Alzheimer's, there were times that I felt I didn't know my mother anymore, and I grieved for it. But despite the fact that Alzheimer's took away many things from the woman that I knew as my mother, 
I have learned a lot from her. I learned how to deal with Alzheimer, how to look for the early signs, and how to battle with the condition. And that's actually what I would like to share with you tonight. I just wish I had not wasted the first few years before I started research on Alzheimer. Um, otherwise, my research result could have been applied to useful to my mom too. In fact, the only way that I could cope with the pain was to put my researcher cap on and look at as my mom as a patient. The stats tells us that every five minutes, there is a new reported dementia case in Canada. Some people believe that um, Alzheimer's is a natural aging process, and some others believe that it is a genetic disease. I don't want to enter that discussion. Nevertheless, perhaps the word uh, condition is more appropriate to be used as opposed to disease. Through my mother, watching closely her symptoms over the years, and also watching a few other patients with, in the same condition as her. What I have learned is that forgetfulness is not necessarily the first sign. In fact, I believe that forgetfulness appear after um, a couple of years past the onset. At the moment, there is no biological measure and no MRI scan that can detect the very early onset of the Alzheimer's. Based on my anecdotal hypo um, observations of mom and a few other patients during the research time, I hypothesize that before any cognitive symptoms appear, becomes apparent, it is the egocentric spatial cognition followed by implicit temporal cognition that are being deteriorated by aging and much more significantly by Alzheimer's. Let me explain what I mean by uh, these two terminologies. Okay. A journey from point A to B is in fact an optimization in terms of time and space. It needs temporal cognition and a spatial cognition. Of course, nobody walk, walks like that creature on the screen unless he or she is in love, which, <laughs> which that suppresses all brain cognition. <laughs> Normally, our brain estimates our speed, estimates the distance, and chooses the most efficient path to reach the destination. We orient ourselves in an environment by two means, allocentric and egocentric. Let's see what they are. Allocentric orientation is when we use some landmarks and cues in the environment to navigate. For example, let's say that you want to go to uh, building address 405 Broadway Avenue. Um, you may wonder why I know that address very well. I have a, fun, a few funny stories about going there, but I'm not going to tell you. Uh, nevertheless, assume this is the first time you got a speeding ticket and you got to go to that building. <laughs> And assume you don't know where it is. You look at the map and you find out that this is one east, uh, one block east of uh, Parliament Legislation Building. Okay, that Parliament Legislation Building is a landmark. You know that when you see that landmark, you should turn east and go one block and you find your, uh, your destination. So, Allocentric orientation, in a way, involves short-term memory. You've got to remember that parliament and that you have to turn right toward the east if you are heading north. But if we are in an environment that there is uh, no landmark, no queue, if we are lost ever in a desert, or if we are in a new city that there is no familiar environment, um, or let's say a, a more familiar example, if you are gone to a new dentist office, have you seen how like a puzzle their cubics are? I always get lost there. Um, and today I was in a dentist's office too. Um, so I was checking my egocentric orientation. Anyway, in such an environment, we rely, we have to rely on our egocentric orientation in order to 
find out where we are and how to navigate, which means that we define our position respect to an object in terms of left, right, front, behind. For example, I know that this screen is on my right and there is a bookshelf on my behind. This knowledge comes to us um, by our egocentric orientation capability. What I'm claiming is that it is the egocentric orientation that is being deteriorated first by aging and much more significantly by Alzheimer's before any other symptoms appear in the, uh, in the person. It is harder to detect deterioration in egocentric orientation because people usually mask it by allocentric, by using the landmarks. So as long as short-term memory is okay, the patient, the person can go undetected for a number of years, like my mother, for example. So back to, again, my anecdotal observations and recollecting memories. With my students, we um, started to design interactive experiments to assess this particular capability of the brain. We tested our first design experiment uh, across different ages. In young adults below 40, 65 plus, and children 7 to 12. This is the error performance of people across ages. As you can see, children and people 65 plus, they were all healthy, by the way, performed very much the same and significantly worse than young adult. What it says, this result is saying that egocentric orientation is deteriorating by age. That is um, a fact. A harsh reality, maybe. Maybe we should practice it, but it is deteriorating. Nevertheless, it happened that we had three individuals at very um, unspecific diagnosis um, suspected of some dementia. I was able to follow up with those three individuals over two, three years. And the result of those three individuals were way worse than the age-matched healthy controls. Over the years, we improved our um, experiments, technologies. This is our current version, which is uh, quite close to a virtual reality. By December, we will really be getting closer to true virtual reality that feels natural. And I would say it is a fun experiment to do too. Um, you're all welcome to come to our lab and try it. Uh, basically, people sit on a wheelchair and run the wheelchair in a virtual building. And it is, as I said, is a fun experiment to do. First, we check the allocentric uh, capability, and then we remove landmarks and cues and check their egocentric orientation. And I believe with this simple test, and even joyful test, by the way, some of my team members called this wheelchair as joy chair, as a, and some others call it wheel stick, as opposed to joystick, because the wheelchair replaces joystick. Um, I believe with this simple technology, we can predict Alzheimer at the very, very early onset. Okay, now you may ask, okay, assume that you can diagnose and predict Alzheimer's, so what? Isn't it better to wait and um, deal with the harsh reality when it occurs and not to worry about it all the time? Well, that's an option that definitely one you may choose. But then I would ask you, what if, God forbidden, what if it happens to you, to your parents, to your life partner? Are you prepared to deal with it? Losing memory, even momentarily, could be quite frightening. Assume one day you wake up and you're blank. You get lost in your own home. How would you feel? Assume one day your life partner confuses you with someone else, how would you react? Are you prepared for it? 
I have no doubt that we can fight with the disease. We can delay it or we can uh, slow the progression. How? Well, by exercising the capabilities that we are naturally use, uh, losing by aging. We are all familiar with the expression use it or lose it when it comes to muscles and physical exercises. But it is so true for the brain functions as well. We know that our brain is plastic. At least the neuroscience experiments research in the last decade has proven that our brain is indeed plastic. It can rewire and rebuild itself. It is true that the plaques and tangles that are associated with Alzheimer's destroy the synapses and the communication between the neurons, but studies have shown that we can create new synapses at any age, even in, in old ages. So with my team, with one of my team members actually is sitting in this audience right now. Um, his name is Sean. You may catch him in the break and ask him more questions if you want. With my team, we designed some simple memory exercises that we target strengthening the associative memory. In fact, strengthening connection between different parts of the brain with the goal that we are creating new synapses. These exercises are for free, available on my webpage. Anybody can use it. Actually, many people are using it right now over the internet. And it is provided in three different languages. Sean provided it in Germany, and Mari wrote it uh, in Spanish, and of course in English. We ran a pilot study using these exercises. We, we engaged 14 individuals of age 70 and older. And we made them, uh, get, got them involved in eight weeks of exercises, eight consecutive weeks, uh, three days a week, and one, day per, uh, one hour per session. And the results showed that it, their memory improvement was quite remarkable. It happened that two of the individuals, we didn't know it at the beginning, but two of the individuals were at some stages, early stages of dementia. And interestingly, the results show that even those two people, as long as they were exercising, they showed improvement. That's why that I'm convinced that these are helpful. And I'm encouraging everybody to try it on a daily basis. In fact, I do try them too, because I live with the fear of Alzheimer's. The next plan that we have is to apply RTMS, um, which is a painless, harmless new technology to um, activate the neurons. RTMS has a lot of application. On Alzheimer's, there has been three groups in the world who have applied it. Uh, Israel, one in Israel, one in Italy, and one in Egypt. The results have been quite encouraging. And I hope that uh, we started in a month or two as well. Um, just to tell you this much, that when I was writing the proposal to get funding for this machine from CFI, um, my dream was to bring my mother back to Canada and to apply it to my own mother just in order to maybe to see her the way she was used to be, just even for a short few minutes. Regretfully, it I got the money when it is too late for my mom, but definitely it is not too late for other people in the same condition. The last thing that I would like to talk to you, share with you to tonight is how to deal with Alzheimer patients. Based on my experience as a researcher, uh, as a family member, or as a caregiver, in dealing with Alzheimer patients. All demented people, at some stage of their condition, become, forget, uh, become delusional. If somebody is hallucinating, if you want to try to argue with them and correct them and bring them to reality, not only it doesn't help, but also it makes them to feel more lost. 
They feel that you don't care, you don't understand, and they are lonely in their own world, and they get agitated because it feels real to them. Last weekend, I called my father. By the way, my father, who was always lovingly caring of my mother, in the last two years, uh, he has also developed some sort of dementia, in my opinion, vascular dementia. I called him, and as soon as he recognized my voice, he said, um, we are under house arrest. The soldiers are around the house, and uh, we need immediate help from you. I said, Dad, um, can you count them? How many are they, or who are they? Dad said, don't you get it? I'm telling you, soldiers are in the around the house, and they are, we are under, under the house arrest. Um, I cannot count them, because they are hiding. My father has been the most logical man I've ever known. Even in his hallucination, he's logical. <laughs> so I said, OK, Dad, I'm in Winnipeg. And it is a long distance. You know that. But I, have a, I know a friend who is influential in the um, police department. I'll call him immediately, and he will come and order the soldiers to leave. This answer calmed him down because it was, first of all, logical, matched with his logic, and in harmony with what he was saying. I was not denying him. So my point is that if you see a demented person, just slowly, gradually shift the conversation and agree with them. Do not deny them in where they are. After all, don't panic. Hallucination, Alzheimer's, is not contagious. Treat them with care and respect, and be patient, because they are like children. So we must have the same patience as we have with the children when they want to learn something. Try to find some words that can trigger some familiar memories for them. After all, no matter how devastating it is to watch a beloved person to go through brain degeneration, it is also a test for us to this to discover what we can do and to push the boundaries of our brain plasticity. It's important to realize that as frightening as Alzheimer is, according to Dr. Whitehouse, a prominent neuropsychologist at Hopkins, Alzheimer's is not even a single condition to be called a disease. Therefore, searching only for biological solution, like medication, gene therapies, is a false hope. In fact, we have to think of brain health and preventing of dementia as a lifetime perspective, and as a lifetime perspective that pays more attention to the quality of our environment than the quality of our genes. The key to future solution for healthy brain aging is going to be a multidisciplinary approach and believing in neuroplasticity. My mother's Alzheimer's shook the one foundation of all my beliefs and view of life, but also taught me the greatest lessons that I could never learn otherwise. I know that Alzheimer's has no mercy, and it can happen to anybody. Despite the fact that I'm a workaholic and work 12 hours a day, six days a week, all the time, and I'm always into reading, writing, using my brain analytically, despite all of that, I know that the chance of me to get Alzheimer's could be quite higher than the average, because I may carry a gene that is associated with Alzheimer. But I'm prepared for it. I admit that I'm afraid, and I'm frightened. I live with that fear. But I'm prepared for it. So, and I'm also at war with this condition. So if it ever happens that I get Alzheimer's, I will not be defeated as long as my students, my children, and other researchers in the field continue the war. I promise that I would be a perfect subject for their research and experiences. <laughs> if I ever forget this uh, promise, well, show me this talk and remind me. <laughs> so the next big thing I say it would be a global war against Alzheimer's, and I'm ready for it. Are you? <laughs>